Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being, with Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, Totality and Infinity. This is the second video. So we're still in section one, the same and the other, but moving into the next subsection, separation and discourse. Um, so we'll just jump straight into the first part of the video today, which is the psychism and interiority. So the psychism, when uh, Levinas talks about that, what he's talking about is the basically the arising of thought, the arising of the I, the consciousness. So it's kind of describing the what Sartre calls the upsurge of the for itself, the the um, the arising of out of this kind of mass of of nothingness that of of pure being, what he calls, what Levinas calls the there is um, in some of his earlier works, this out of this just pure being there emerges this kind of break where you get this individualized cogito, this I, this individual consciousness. And that's what um, the psychism is. And if you've read any of his earlier his earlier work, I'm thinking especially of his two um, articles, really, well not articles, short, I guess essays, they're kind of long essays, about about 100 pages, I think, uh, maybe, maybe less, Existence and Existence, and um, Time and the Other, I think is the other one, but in that, in that he refers to this, like, undifferentiated being, the uh, like a, a kind of existence he calls that there is the there is and that's kind of what it's just pure existence and out of that he's trying to explain or understand how we get these individual consciousnesses that we are and that event he calls the psychism here but in those earlier essays he calls um he calls it the hypostasis. So anyway, that's just kind of a little bit of background there. Let's move into what, what the psychism is. The arising of thought, the I, from being. Uh, and this is an act of total, absolute separation that precedes and makes possible the subsequent separation from the metaphysical other that we've been talking about, that we talked about in the last video. So this is kind of, and it's a little bit confusing because um, Levinas, as I remember, he isn't that clear that he's suddenly switching now to talk about this different um, other, in, in a sense. So now we're talking about a, a new relation that we have with an other, an absolute other, but it's it's different from the metaphysical other we were talking about in the last um, in the last video, which is which is other people. Now we're talking about this this separation between I and pure existence, being the there is. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of of um, ambiguity there. Actually, I think he's not a, he's not as clear as he could be, or perhaps he's deliberately um, making the point that that it's a similar kind of relation in the sense that existence is for us this um, absolute other. It's an absolute alterity, similar to, but, but obviously different from the absolute alterity of other people. In the sense that this 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 alterity that we're talking about now it precedes that it's it's um, a prerequisite for the relation of absolute alterity with the with other people. Uh, so this this separation, this absolute separation, maintains the separated being at a distance from itself through the cogito, which allows it to reflect on itself. And that's basically allowing us to be conscious of ourselves. And and the way I see Levinas talking about this is um, 
the separation, the hypostasis, the hypostasis or the psychism that we're calling it in, in totality and infinity. The psychism is this kind of break that arises in being. And it's a break in which a part of being separates from the rest. And it separates in the sense not that it pulls away or, or detaches in some way. But it separates in the sense that it now becomes, um, there's now a, a little bit of distance between itself and itself, <laughs> if that makes sense. There's now a distance between what it is and itself, so that it's possible for it to be aware of itself as, it's, as a thing. And that's what, what self-consciousness is, right? That, and that, um, I think, is, is a key part of any description of consciousness. The ability to, to detach oneself from oneself, to take a, pos a position on oneself, to make an object of oneself for oneself. And so that, um, th it's that kind of, it's when that happens in being, that you get this separation, that the I arises, that consciousness arises. And one um, feature that Levinas talks about regarding this is, or the, regarding the way that this happens, is he talks about it as a production of a chronological order in which the being is not yet, or not all at once. So there's, again, there's a sense of a bit of a delay between what the being is and um, <clears throat> the being's kind of awareness of itself. So there's, there's a, a bit of a, a, a break arises in there. And it arises in the sense that there's, there's a little bit of a distance created. And this, this is basically Sartre's nothingness. Right? There's a nothingness interposed between the for itself and itself, and essentially this is this is the same thing. I think there's a, there's a bit of a gap now created, and it's it's created in a chronological sense, so that the being is not it's not not yet. It's not there's a bit of a um, temporal break because it is what it is, but then there's this separation, which means it's not quite. Um, the being doesn't quite gel with itself. It doesn't quite um, come together. There, there's a bit of a, a delay, if you like. I am that thing, but the fact that I'm conscious of that thing as well um, sets up this, this dichotomy. And um, Levinas sees that as, as being a tied to chronology and he says something interesting which is worth uh, looking at he says even its cause older than itself is still to come and uh, and I think what he's getting at there is that the cause of this being the cause of this I the this, the um, the psychism which is older than itself because it preceded the existence of the I, but it's still to come in the sense that it, it doesn't qualify, if you like, as an arising of anything until the being is capable of seeing it in that way, of seeing it as an arising. And it's only capable of seeing it as an arising after it's already arisen, after the, the psychism's already taken place. And so its, it's um, genesis, if you like, is later than its actual, um, than, than the actual psychism itself, because it doesn't become a proper arising, a proper genesis, until the individual recognizes it as such until the individual thinks it and knows it. Um, and that's interesting. 
and he also notes an objection you might make here to and say that yeah the uh the being kind of becomes aware of its of its um inception but this is just memory or or thought it's nothing real um but that's exactly levinas's point is that it is memory or thought and memory or thought is something that we is exactly what we're trying to explain it's exactly what we're talking about the the whole realm of of the kagita of consciousness and that itself is a revolution in being that is the the thing that we're trying to explain the event that we're trying to understand here how it is that memory or thought can actually mean anything and um <clears throat> so to say that to, to kind of write this off as it, it's nothing more than thought is to miss the point because that is that is the point thought memory how how is this um possible that in itself is a revolution in being i like that expression revolution in being uh, and the separation he calls atheism so the psychism where the i becomes separate from being is atheism um, and he says one lives outside of god at home with oneself one is an i an egoism so okay so we're you know we're connect connecting this I, i've talked about the kind of conflation here I, that i think is going on between philosophy and religion but that's fine this this is this is the um these are the the terms this is the what's the word i'm looking i'm always struggling for words in these videos this is the framework in which levinas is working so we'll run with it the separation is atheism um in terms in the sense that and and again there, there is kind of it's feasible in a way you know there's a a distance from transcendence there's some kind of break yeah we can see um a parallel even if even if again i i think it's overreaching but um fine this is this is the psychism it's the arising of the i uh, what's interesting about this though is that it means the kogito is naturally atheist and so atheism is not in this sense something that happens after existence you don't the i doesn't exist and then decide to either believe in god or be atheist right to be i should keep the the, the terminology i guess doesn't just decide to be religious or atheist from its inception it's atheist that's what it is to be atheist is to have the separation take place and without the separation there's nothing there's just being just the there is just existence itself so atheism kind of has a has a bit of a deeper meaning here and it, what's what's really interesting actually is this is a theme that that is in many other existential thinkers as well kierkegaard talks about the same thing regarding anxiety and despair as well these are things that these are states that can't be avoided it's, we we have to go through these in order to come out the other side for kierkegaard that means um what does he call it the absolute relation with the absolute to have an absolute relation to the absolute something like that but essentially salvation right there is no salvation without anxiety without despair heidegger authenticity there is no authenticity without inauthenticity we are naturally in that state of fallenness falling prey there's no and and it's ontological so it's not something that we can get rid of it's it's just a part of what it is to be a human being to exist it's the same thing with sartre's bad faith there's no we can't avoid being in bad faith and, and as he memorably says even good faith is bad faith it's just a part of what it is to be a human being and same thing here atheism it's it's just what it is to exist as as an i 
So that's uh, kind of an interesting point. Uh, this I then, so just going back to the I, the cogito, this maybe consciousness, it appears integrated in a whole, but this in fact only happens at death. The interiority of the I, which, which um, is kind of what the word that Levinas uses to describe this separated being. It has an interiority now, which is separate from the exteriority of existence. Um, and that, that's the sense in which the psychism has happened, that the being is a being. So it has an interiority, it has a leave of absence from being totalized. It's that, that interiority, the fact that there is an interior here that has somehow come about from pure being, that just the fact that that exists gives this being a leave of absence from being totalized. It means it cannot be totalized again until that um, interiority, that awareness of oneself, that uh, chronological disparity that arises until that is dissipated, the being, the, the individual being, cannot be brought into a relation of totality with everything again. It, it, it is, by definition of what it is, it's separate from, from being. And this comes through, interestingly, when he talks about, he kind of drifts, or he, the conversation moves into a discussion of birth and death. And regarding birth, the, and I think not so much, I don't know actually if it's, he I'm not sure if he mentions the word birth itself, but he, he talks, he's definitely talking about the beginning or the arising of the I, um, which you know, I think birth is a, is a good enough, is, a, is as good a place as any to kind of start from, wherever you want to put that line whether it's at the moment of birth or sometime before or after conception or whatever, it doesn't matter. That's kind of um, a, different, a different story. But that moment of, of um, that beginning, as we talked about, it's recaptured in memory. So it, it's, it, in a sense, arises after it's already taken place. We discussed that. But what's important for Levinas here is that the being grounds itself retroactively then. So at the moment, at the, the, the point of inception, the, the, uh, the psychism, there is no being to be separated in the first place. There is no being to, to have this event happen to it. That doesn't happen until after the psychism until after the being is, is able to take ownership of it, take responsibility for it. And that happens much later. So again, there's this chronological disparity cropping up. So the, the, um, the being can only ground itself, can only take responsibility for itself long after the event which birthed it, which, which gave birth to its... its um, emergence from being has already finished. So that's the first point. That, that's kind of going to the beginning. And looking at the other end, towards death, the end, he says that for the historiographer, the end of the being is a totalizing event in which the being becomes past. So the being now becomes finished, it, it merges becomes a part of the past and it becomes totalized. It's now a part of everything. There's no sense in which there is any interiority. There's no separation anymore. Then it, it fully becomes um, a part of this greater whole. But that's for the historiographer. For the post-psychism being itself as interiority, separated from being, 
separated from itself through that that um, capacity to to reflect on itself, to think about itself. For that post psychism being becoming past is impossible. So death. For that post-psychism being itself is not the end of the being. Such a thing just doesn't make sense. There is no... Death cannot be thought of in that way. It's, it's only the end of a being for someone else, for the, for the recorder of my life. It's not that way for me as I'm living my life. And we'll talk more about death later, but, uh, but that's just a nice little... Interest, uh, a nice little kind of thing to think about as we move on. The, the, this first section, I think, is very much, it's very broad. There's just kind of introducing a lot of the themes that, that we're going to flesh out later in the other parts. But this leads us into a, a brief discussion of time as well. And Levinas separates two kinds of time here, history and historical time which is third person. This is the universal time. It's kind of a time in which everything happens, judged from um, a distance, judged from a third person perspective. And this is opposed to the time of mortal existence. And this one is first person. So each being then has its own time in its, in its own interiority. Um, so that we, Milo Ponti or Sartre would call this lived time, I think, and that's um, that's just kind of a distinction that Levinas draws as well. But what this time of mortal existence means is that life is can't really be seen as absurd or meaningless anymore, because my life flows by in a different time to history. It can't be um, measured by the same standards. It, it doesn't conform to the same structure that historical time does. So my time, because it is my time, it's the time of my existence, my interiority, has meaning for me. Um, and, that, and that's what it gives it meaning, is that it's it's for me, it's my time. It's not just this general time that's applicable to everybody in which events happen and and you know things just proceed in, in in an apparently absurd and meaningless way the fact that it's my time that it that it happens in my life for me makes it meaningful and just before we leave this this section um Levinas talks about the metaphysical or ontological structure of the separated being a little bit. And we'll get into this in a lot more detail in the next section, I think. But uh, he talks about this structure as being enjoyment or happiness. Fundamentally, that's what it is. The I is separated. And even though it's um, separate from itself we, we we discussed that in the last video as well the way that the eye doesn't quite coincide with itself nevertheless it identifies with itself completely it's uh, it is um the eye is not an absolute other to me i identify with it with it um even as it is even as i don't coincide with it completely so this I, this separated I, this this being with an interiority, this sameness, this this post psychism being that identifies with itself is complete, in a sense, which means that it's happy. It exists happy. It exists in a. Um, it is for itself. I don't. I don't want to bring in. Sartre, I don't mean it in the in the in the Sartrean sense. I mean it in the in the, the way that Levinas talks about it. It it is complete. It is a um, a whole. The other I as as um, as this relation with myself is nevertheless a relation of sameness. So it 
I am complete in and of myself. And that means that I'm happy. My, my existence is fundamentally characterized by happiness or joy. So happiness is not added on to an already existing being. This is what we're talking about again. This is why this is ontological. It's not, <clears throat> we don't have, we don't exist first and then become happy. We exist as happiness because we exist as complete, as this, this relation of sameness within ourselves. Separated from being, separated from the there is, um, but within ourselves as, as consciousnesses, as cogito, we are we are happy. Uh, and he says, so yeah, instead of happiness being added on to an already existing being, the I exists as separated in its enjoyment, that is, as happy. And he calls this the psychism of enjoyment. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss more about, we'll dis discuss that more later. But again, just a nice um, kind of starting point for us. And this is obviously different from desire and separate from that metaphysical desire we talked about in the first video where desire comes from the object itself from the object that is an absolute object an absolute alterity and that is Levinas in, in um, typical religious fashion calls revelation so revelation is is the desire that the other arouses in us because, why revelation? Because it's coming across that infinite distance. It's coming from an absolute other, which is absolutely beyond us, beyond our influence. So it, it's, it's appearing as, this desire is appearing as revelation, as coming out of nowhere, if you like, coming from nothing. As opposed to need, which um, is a void in the subject which is something if we were in if we were in being in time we'd call that ontic probably an ontical um, description so need is comes from the subject and it's it reflects a lack in in the subject desiring something else whereas capital D desire comes from the object and that is revelation um, but since desire, and this is the reason why I brought that up, since desire is independent of need, different from need, um, Levinas calls it a luxurious need, kind of a, a need that's over and, and above, over and beyond um, the normal ontic needs that we might feel, because it's it's a it's a need, if you like, if it's a need that's coming from an absolute alterity. It's not something that we can ever satisfy. Um, and in that sense, yeah, luxurious need, a need kind of over and above our regular needs. Okay, let's have a look at the second part of the video today, truth and discourse. And so carrying on from desire, which, which we were just talking about, desire being that <clears throat> um, drive outwards to uh, a metaphysical other, an, an absolute alterity, that brings us quite nicely to truth, which is exactly that. It's a quest outwards towards a being other than the same. Um, and that's how Levinas defines truth, so truth is is uh, interwoven with his idea of, of this absolute other and the relation that we establish there, in which the other's otherness is always respected, is never lost. So that means that truth and error only arise in separation. And without separation, there's no truth, only being. So there has to be some kind of separation first, and this is going back to kind of the atheism point, without the atheism first, there is no sense in which you can um, have a relation with 
a transcendence with, with an absolute other. There's no sense in which truth makes means anything. Um, and I think we can see um, maybe this works in both for both kinds of otherness, both kinds of others, othernesses that we're talking about here, the, the original separation in the psychism, which creates um, or which which is the founding, if you like, of the I. There's no truth without that, but there's also no truth without, and so in that case, there's only being. There is no, nothing else. There's nothing to to engage in a search for truth. To 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 um, to be in a, a relation of truth without that original psychism. But also, there's no without the the um, the absolute other as in the form of other people. And, and which will ultimately end up being um, God, there's no truth without a kind of a distance being maintained between me and that other, whether it's other people or God. So there has to be that distance in order for truth to, um, to exist and, and error. So it's prior to, again, we're not talking about existence first and then truth or error kind of coming on top of that. This is an ontological um, distinction. It's an ontological point. The uh, truth is, a, is fundamentally a quest to, towards this, this other, which, uh, which we are naturally, by definition, separated from. And must remain separated from. I think that's probably the key. And the other thing that I want to say about truth is it takes place in language. Truth arises where a being separated from the other is not engulfed in him, but speaks to him. So there's, this comes back, I think we kind of touched on this in the last video, that face-to-face -face relation where the other, we talked about the, the kind of, importance of the word expression for Levinas. So this is what um, he's getting at here. Language is, is the, the, um, the way by which this relation is established because we can't bring them into, we can't totalize them in a relation with us. There's always this gap and the, the language is, is kind of not the way this gap is overcome, because the gap is never overcome. The, the distance is never um, eliminated. But it's the way in which the, the relation kind of manifests, the other manifests. It's the only kind of relation we can have with an absolute other. So it happens when the other speaks to me and I speak to the other. And that brings us to discourse. And we've talked about the a knowledge of things, which we called comprehension. Levinas doesn't seem to be too um, consistent with that or too rigorous with the, the distinction between comprehension and, and knowledge. But um, yeah, we talked about that as, as, as comprehension, where the, the two terms are absorbed into one relation, into a totality. And in and, and this situation, truth is disclosure. Thinking of Heidegger here, probably. So truth is, is a disclosure, which is, therefore, always relative to us and our projects. It's a, truth is a relation which then must always be interpreted. So it always stands in relation to us. It's always another uh, it's it's a an, an an other which is another which is which acts kind of like a pole a separate pole but within one system. I used that analogy a lot in the first video I remember. So that's kind of knowledge of things. Knowledge of the other, on the other hand, in knowledge of the other, the terms remain absolute. They remain absolutely separated. They don't come together into a whole. And truth is a manifestation. 
for truth is manifestation. And by manifestation, Levinas means um, or, or what, what manifestation consists in. It consists in a being telling itself to us independently of every position we would have taken in its regard, expressing itself. The absolute experience is not disclosure, but revelation. So that's just the whole point of uh, Levinas making this distinction between him, him and himself and uh, Heidegger. Truth is not disclosure, but it's revelation because it's coming to us from this absolute other, from this this um, other term which we can never relativize, we can never totalize, bring it into a system, including us. So expression, the importance of expression here comes to the fore, expression as discourse, as, as a speaking, um, as a being telling itself to us, independently of, a, of any position and every position we could take regarding it. It always transcends that it always transcends our thoughts, our, our, the, the categories that we try and pin it down to, that we, the boxes that we try and um, fit it into. It always transcends those, and it does so as soon as it speaks to us. It, it, it's, an, it's an automatic um, escape from any, any kind of forms we try and impose on it. Um, so And so Levinas says expression takes place over and beyond form, beyond the uh, kind of picture, the image we try and set up to capture the other. And it takes place over and beyond that, it takes place in the face. So he says face undoes the form. That's a nice little, um, I'm not sure if that's a quote. I'm sure that's a quote. I didn't put it in quotes, but um, I'm sure it is. Face undoes the form that the, ex the, the other expressing themselves robs the form that we've tried to create, the image that we've tried to pin them down to, to lock them into. That's a nice expression. And so this undoing is to signify or to have a meaning. And, it's, and to present oneself by signifying is to speak. And that's exactly what Levinas means by discourse, the production of meaning. And the production of meaning can only take place in something that transcends whatever meaning we try and impose on it. So that, that speaking, the expressing from the, of the other, um, is precisely production of, of new meaning for us. It's meaning that even if we might have guessed it, even if we might have um, been correct in, in our image of the other, just by the fact that the other does it, they escape that image. They, they produce their own meaning, which, which our um, representations of never come close to, never come close to, to um, perfectly capturing. And this means that a couple of things about discourse here, discourse as the production of meaning, means it doesn't need words. Discourse doesn't require actual speaking. The manifestation of the face is already discourse. Just the fact of the other appearing before us um, already produces meaning for us, already produces meaning that we didn't create. It already intimates this transcendence that, uh, that we cannot totalize. He talks about action as well, and this, this is really interesting. Action is not discourse. Uh, because acts and works, things that and things that people do, you know, books they write, paintings they paint, whatever, acts and works signify the author in the third person. 
So they don't, they're, they're not a genuine contact, if you like. They, they, they point out the other, but only from a third person perspective. They're not, it's not direct. It's like an indirect um, glimpse. And so Levinas says they expose the other, but they don't express. The other doesn't express themselves directly, um, which makes sense, right? Because acts, behavior, um, things, works of art, works of, of literature, whatever, things that people do, um, once they're done, they exist kind of separate from the other. There's no, and we can then go to work on them, pulling them apart and, and analyzing them and putting putting um, them into categories and, and applying meaning. Um, so they exist kind of separately from the other themselves. Whereas expression is always a direct, um, I guess we could say like an engagement with the other. And, and, and that's what discourse is for Levinas. So action is not discourse because it's third person. And I, I like this expression. He says it, the acts or works allow us to enter into the other's interiority by burglary as if we kind of sneak in and surprise them, catch them unawares <laughs> um, in their kind of in their interiority. But it's not a genuine connection for those reasons. Um, so language itself, language discourse is the coinciding of the revealer and the revealed in the face, in that direct um, relation, in that direct encounter. And he, he talks about Husserl and Heidegger as well, who both miss this. They miss the face-to-face. -face. They miss expression, the importance of expression. Husserl, because he sees the other as an alter ego. He understands the other um, by way of analogy with with myself and Heidegger who was only concerned with being in general with ontology both of those um, both of those methods miss the genuine face-to-face -face encounter that, that Levinas is, is um, so concerned with he also talks here a little bit about European thought in general, which rejected the idea of man as measure of all things, meaning that it could not found reason. So instead, so the I then was defined by reason, defined by this impersonal and universal um, force, this power. So that became the focus, the impersonal, the universal reason itself became prior to, in a sense, the individual. And this reduces language to the coherence of its concepts. And interestingly enough, this is then a suppression of the other, who, being other, being transcendent, being an, an absolute alterity, is irrational, is fundamentally unable to be brought into this, this kind of the coherence that we're trying to establish, they break that coherence by just by being what they are, other. Um, so for European thought, that has always been geared towards a suppression, a, a um, yeah, I can't think of another word for that, a suppression of the other, whereas for, for Levinas, it's the exact opposite, language grounds universal, universality and gener generality. <clears throat> Language as this direct um, expression is not a manifestation of the universal and the general. It's what grounds the universal and the general. It's prior to it. It's more, more um, I don't want to say more important, but it's, it's, it's prior to anyway. <clears throat> Okay, um, we also need to talk about rhetoric, and this is 
a situation in which it's a relation which doesn't face the other, but approaches them obliquely. So it's not a direct face-to-face -face encounter. It gets, it approaches the other obliquely. So it resists discourse. And a nice way that Levinas puts this, he says it corrupts the freedom of the other by applying categories, by trying to treat the other as, as, as kind of a, um, a particular individuation of a universal, for example, rather than seeing them in their genuine um, individuality, they're, they're coming to that true face-to-face -face encounter. So in doing that, applying these categories, applying these universal concepts, we treat the other like a thing. And that um, is a no-no for Levinas. Some examples he gives of rhetoric then are propaganda, flattery, diplomacy. And you can see these are all things that are applied to anybody, to, to, any, to all people. We, we can use these kind of tactics when we're dealing with anyone. You can, propaganda is aimed at individuals, but it's, it's aimed at this kind of... Um, no individual in particular. It's aimed at every individual. Not as individuals themselves, but as this kind of mass of people. Same with flattery. It doesn't, it doesn't address the other as, as a transcendent individual themselves. It addresses the other kind of with a view to getting something from them. So there's, there's again, disingen uh, it's disingenuous in a sense. And diplomacy as well. I mean, you can you can see where that's going. So he calls this an injustice. Injustice is um, wrapped up with the idea of maintaining the other as an absolute alterity, maintaining them at a distance. If we do that, that's that's just for Levinas. So when, whenever we don't do that, whenever we try and reduce them to something that we can totalize, that we can establish um, a relation of totality with, then it's, it's injustice. And this brings us to the last point that I want to make in the second section. Nakedness, nudity, not that kind of, of nudity. The other for Levinas is, because they're completely transcendent, that's um, Levinas describes that as being naked, as uh, in this, and in the sense, kind of like the pure, kind of unadulterated. Not there's no, we we can't apply any any categories or forms to them. We can't, you know, they're, they're absolute, an absolute alterity. That's um, they kind of stand in their purity without any addition from me without any any um, adornments that I might try and put on them. Uh, and in that sense, for Levinas, they're naked. Things as well can be naked, and, and they appear as such when they're not absorbed in the accomplishment of the function for which they're made. And so when we, and this is the, the whole disclosure thing again when we when we see things in relation to our goals when we see them in terms of their function for us then they at this point they disappear beneath their form they disappear beneath that form which we've imposed on them and so we're not seeing the thing itself we're not seeing the thing naked. We're seeing it clothed in um, the forms that we're, we are kind of imposing on it. For a thing, nudity is the surplus of its being over its finality. It is its absurdity, its uselessness. The thing is always an opacity, a resistance, an ugliness. And so I think there, that's interesting. The... Uh, form, the form that we apply, that we put onto things, gives them meaning. It makes them fit 
into a world, into our world, into my world. But it does so at the cost of what the thing is in its purity, in its, in its nakedness. We lose that. We, we only see it in terms of, in like, um, in its utility for us. So you can see, like, that, that whole idea of, of um, that kind of Heideggerian disclosure. It's, it's so connected with us that it doesn't it doesn't allow the thing itself to stand before us and when it does when the thing stands before us naked it appears absurd useless because it's no lo- it no longer has those forms of of utility and function that we that we put on it and so the thing itself the nude thing the naked thing is always opaque it's always a resistance. It's always ugly. It doesn't fit into the world the way that we want it to. It, it always has this kind of presence that is um, beyond us, beyond our grasp, simply because that's the way that we. Uh, that's the way that it is, as something, as as what it is in itself. It's removed from our desires and our goals and our and our wants. And all of those things. And so he calls, this ties into his theory of beauty. Beauty is what art and science do when they clothe things with signification. This covers their nakedness and discloses them by forms. In a kind of perverse sense, it discloses them by distorting them. Discloses them by covering over what they actually are, making them fit into the um, the framework that we've established, that we've put in place. Whereas for Levinas, it's the opposite. Language enters into a relationship with a nudity disengaged from forms, i.e. having meaning by itself. Language gets us to and so we're talking about people now, again, not, not so much things, but the, the point of language is that it gets us, it gives us this relationship with something in its nudity, with another person in their nudity, not covered over by um, what value they have for me or what how they can kind of fit into my, into my world, into my goals. Um, and, and that's, again, just kind of the importance of discourse for, for Levinas. Okay, let's have a look at the last section, the divine relation. Ultimately, for Levinas, the metaphysical relation, this desire, is going to be understood as with God. The metaphysical relation is ultimately with God. It's a divine one. Um... And he goes on to say, and this, this is kind of interesting, I mean, it's it's religious, so if you don't believe in God, like me, it's it's kind of over and above surplus to requirements, if you like. But, um, but still, it's an interesting take on religion, I guess. Um, you can see it in this way. Um, the relation with God and the relation we have with the human other are actually one and the same. And... I'll read just as a, a short quote here. The dimension of the divine opens forth from the human face. So other people are needed, are needed here for this relation with the divine, but not as mediators. We don't go to God through other people. But Levinas says the uprightness of the face to face opens a breach through which the divine is revealed. So it's not that we, the other is kind of like a stepping stone to God, but the other is, or well, that relation, that transcendent relation we have with the other, with other people, is what creates the, um, the opening, the breach through which um, a relation with God is possible. 
So that's kind of a nice take on this. If you believe in God, that, that's kind of a good way to go, I think. It's a nice way to go here. And he says, this what this means, a couple of consequences from this, is that the relation with God can only happen in ethics. That is to say, with another, with, with other people. So we have to, we need other people in order to have a relation with God. And the relation can, the relation with God can only happen in justice. In that, that is to say, in the direct and honest face-to-face -face encounter. Um, and so that's kind of cool too, tying in ethics and justice, tying ethics and justice into um, the relation with God, not as as things that we do in order to get to God, but things that we have to, a, a way that we have to to live, a way that we have to um, live with other people, with these, these transcendent others, these absolute alterities, um, in order to see God, if you like. Okay, let's have a look at a summary. So first we looked at the psychism. The first section was the psychism or interiority. And this is basically consciousness, the arising of consciousness, the arising of the individual I, the cogito. And Levinas describes this as a separation. Um, he also uses the word atheism. We talked about the way that that was significant because... Every individual is atheist from the beginning. Atheism is a part of what it is to be a separated individual. And this means that we can never be integrated into a whole. We are always separated from being, being itself. And this led to a, a distinction between historical time and the time of, of mortal existence. And those um, kind of break down into a third person description and or a third person account and a first person account. <clears throat> and finally, the psychism was characterized by enjoyment. That was the fundamental mode, if you like, of being of, of a, a separated individual. Then we looked at truth, which was a quest outwards towards a being other than the same. So really connected to the idea of this transcendent other. The way that Levinas talks about this as a revelation, not as disclosure, specifically differentiating himself from Heidegger. He does a lot of differentiating himself from Heidegger, actually. So this is just the first of, of many instances of that. But important because revelation has that, that sense of something coming to us from a radical other, from a, a kind of from nothing, if you like. Whereas disclosure is a relative revelation. It's, it's, a, derelict, it's a relative um, apprehension of something. And truth always takes place in discourse. That's a key element of truth for Levinas. And that moves us into discourse itself, which actually is the production of meaning. And this occurs in expression or the face. And this means that, importantly, discourse does not mean speaking. It doesn't, it doesn't reduce to words and speaking. Um, any kind of, any, any time meaning is... Anytime meaning appears for us, which we don't create, that is, that is discourse, that is expression. The opposite of this was rhetoric, and rhetoric resists discourse. It's kind of, um, it treats the other, in a sense, as a thing. It treats the other as, as um, a collective, rather than, than that direct, face-to-face -face engagement that we talked about and finally the relation with god and this could only be realized in ethics and justice so tying in that the relation with god to our relation with our relations with other people and 
God is only accessible through those, through that relation, not as, not with other people being mediators, but with other people, that relation kind of, as uh, Levinas describes it, opening a breach through which God becomes accessible. Okay, and that's it for me in this video. Um, hopefully if, you, if you've if you read Levinas before or you're reading through him now, that helps you in some way. I say at the end of every video. Eh? Anyway, thanks for listening. I'll catch you in the next video. Until then.